So we are now on to our program for the evening. A few housekeeping announcements. Again, if you have any questions or comments during any part of tonight's program, please use the chat function. We'll respond to questions at the end of the presentation. Please turn off your video during the presentation to avoid distractions. So I am delighted to present our speaker for tonight's program, Alvaro Jaramillo. Alvaro is a distinguished and enthusiastic birder, author of the Field Guide of Birds of Chile. He worked with other birders on the chapter on sparrows, my big bugaboo, in American Birding Association Field Guide to Birds of California. He was awarded the Eisman Medal by the Linnaean Society of New York for excellent, not only in ornithology, but for encouragement of the amateur birder. This mix of outstanding attention to the technical part of birding, while also having the ability to stimulate interest and increasing confidence in the art of birding, is part of what makes Alvaro so special. His talk tonight is on precisely that, the art and the science of birding. Please welcome me and join me, please join me in welcoming Alvaro Paramillo. Right, great. Uh, Thank you, Judy and Dave, um, uh, for also, you know, Moral Coast Audubon for hosting this. Um, and um, let me just start sharing the screen here with you. And I gather that uh, we're going to have questions on the chat and then we'll answer, do all the answering of the questions afterwards, which, um, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm glad to stay as much time as we need to do questions. But also, um, you know, I, it's kind of funny that today um, my connection to Morro Bay, the Morro Coast, is even greater than it was uh, a few weeks ago, as my, my son just started at Cal Poly today for his first year. So I'll probably be going up and down the coast, uh, visiting him uh, on a regular basis in, in the next four years or so. So uh, you'll probably see me around a, a little bit more and hopefully I'll be able to catch some birding while I'm, while I'm out there, not just the pelagic trips. But um, so this, this talk is about a lot of different things, you know, and um, it, there's an aspect of it that is just about birding and the beauty of birding and what birding brings to you when you do it. And also, some of the mechanics of how this happens when you identify a bird and how your brain is actually um, working through all of the information that you intake as a as a birder, as a you know observer of, of nature, and um, and hopefully you know I'll touch on some things that you might have maybe never thought about in in the way in that I presented, but that you probably experienced out there, and you sort of say, ah, okay. That's what's happening, but there's a lot of complexity in in what we do when we're out there birding. But one thing we need to start with is when you're out there in the natural environment, there's all sorts of things that happen that you might not even be aware of that are happening. So this is this is not too far away from where I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and um, in Stanford, there's been a lab, uh, Gregory Ratman, who's been working on this idea that if you are in nature, your brain chemistry changes versus when you are in, in an urban environment. They've been doing tests with people, usually students, uh, taking them to, you know, having them go out right into the city and come back and they're tested for all of this sort of body chemistry and brain function versus when they go out in nature. And all of these um, kind of correlates with depression, broodiness, rumination, that that you know we can sort of get into when when things are sort of stressful and so forth, they're released. They actually you you get a benefit by going out in nature that makes your mind actually relax compared to when you're in the city. Now this might be obvious to a lot of people, but they're proving it now scientifically. And one of the things that seems to happen is that there are just patterns in nature that we gravitate to and that we kind of fixate on and, and just sort of think about and it relaxes us in the sort of in the same way that meditation does and sort of the patterns of coastlines, trees, flowers, you know, these actually often they're fractal patterns, patterns where that each sort of bit, you know, that 
closer you get into it, it sort of looks the same as the far away version. So a tree, you go into the branches and you sort of see another little tree and you keep going in there. And those kind of fractal patterns have this effect of um, relaxing us, but it's not this. See if this is a fractal pattern, but this is not gonna do anything for you. You have to see the real thing. You have to see the real natural fractal patterns. And that is what, um, what um, does it. So, you know, I always say birds, they're the gateway drug to nature. So if we're gonna get some benefit from nature, how do you get out there? Birds are one of the ways that we get out there and, um, and you know, sort of have motivation to just uh, go out and see these, these animals, see everything that's, that's going on. Um, and there's just so much beauty in birds too, that just the aesthetics of, of something like a Townsend's warbler, you know, a Jaeger, the lines of the shapes of something like a Jaeger so that may not have that much color, even the movement, how they move, how they chase to the butterfly-like flight of, of a short-eared owl. These are all things that we're sort of taking in and we appreciate. There's beauty in things that aren't just colorful. And that's what we do as birders. We are really sort of seeking out amazing creatures that we see and enjoy. And also that give us some pleasure that isn't just seeing them and maybe putting them on our list, but the entire natural world is giving us a different perspective on uh, how we see our lives as well, you see. And to me, one of the most amazing things about birding is that it's the most portable hobby that there is, I think. I think, you know, you can do all sorts of things with your time. You can be golfing, you can be, you know, um, doing, playing soccer, you can be playing cards, chess, what have you. But birding, you can do everywhere, middle of the ocean, Antarctica, you know, on isolated islands, anywhere you go, you can be birding. That's not the case with most other activities. They really aren't so portable. And they also, I would say it's like a good hot sauce because a really good hot sauce goes well with all sorts of food, right? And birding can be like an add-on to all sorts of other things that you do. So you can do it at times exclusively, or you can be doing other things and then add birding onto that. Like I often am driving and I'm birding. Obviously, you know, I keep my eyes on the road, but you know, you're just out there working and you're watching birds as they go over or just walking around with your dog and the birds are going over and you're just taking, taking them in or, you know, have a great dinner after a, um, a day out birding and, and all of that is, you know, can, can happen. It's led me to some amazing experiences, you know, from seeing lava flowing into the ocean in Hawaii to, you know, a shark attack on the Farallon Islands to, even this little storm petrel that um, down here, the Pinkoya storm petrel that I helped to describe as a new species to science. And the original sighting was just while I was birding. And uh, so it, it's led me to some amazing things and it leads all, everybody to amazing places and experiences. And um, it's just sort of a never ending uh, quest. We, as people have a love of living things. It's just part of our nature. And, you know, even people that sometimes do, you don't think are nature oriented, they have pets, they have plants in their house, they have all sorts of things that are really their love for living things, you know, so you don't have to be a birder necessarily to have this intrinsic connection to um, the rest of life. Everybody has it to some extent, and some people haven't really sort of thought about it and, and developed it to the full extent of getting out there, you know, in the natural system every so often. And once they do, they feel good. They feel good about being out there. There, there are other things that correlate too, like days of the year are really a different thing for a birder than for an average non-birding person. Every day is different. Migration rolls through. There are times of the year when certain things happen, weather where certain things happen. We're paying attention to every single day, every single weather system, when it rains, when it doesn't rain, we're kind of paying attention to all this. And this is also vital to really sort of feeling like we're 
um, in place, you know, sort of in, you know, enjoying that time in the world rather than having every day just sort of feel like it's the same thing. Birders actually pay attention to the day. And, you know, it can start out as simply as just looking at the backyard birds, you know, with the colorful um, goldfinches and house finches to the crazy level of, uh, you know, competitive birding and chasing rarities, finding rarities, listing big years and all that. And it's all part of this broad spectrum where all of it is birding and you can find your place within that spectrum that makes you happy. And, you know, one of the things that, the uh, first things that happen, I think, when we're learning birds is that we start trying to figure out what they're called, you know? So you realize that there's American goldfinches, lesser goldfinch, ah, and there's, you know, Lawrence's goldfinch, this one over here. Um, or you travel through and you want to, you see this gorgeous warbler and it's the pink headed warbler and we, make sense of things by naming them. And this leads to identification. Um, and some of these things, obviously, you know, pink headed warbler is so cool looking. You don't, need, you don't need to know its name to enjoy it, but there's a level of understanding that does happen when we know what it is and that we can put it into broader context an ecological context and various other things that sort of make having the name valuable. And um, that's what identification is all about really. And for some people, identification of some things like this can be a nightmare, right? A goal for some birders is just a complete nightmare. This is a young herring gull. I love gulls and I like them because, and I'll explain why I like them maybe as we go through, but they, uh, they're like a puzzle to me that is fun. But if, it, if this is a nightmare, for you, like, listen to that. You don't have to be watching goals if you don't enjoy goals. For example, New York Times crossword puzzle. Some people love this. You know, they, they, they can't wait to get their hands on a crossword puzzle and go through it all. For me, this is a nightmare. I just, this would stress me out and I don't get it. I don't understand how it all works. And uh, I, you know, doesn't work, but I understand that. So I don't do crosswords. Same thing. If you don't like goals, don't do goals. And the uh, title of this talk actually comes from a book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's about brain function. And it's amazing when I read this book that I was saying, boy, this really applies to birding. There's all sorts of stuff in here that is um, related to what we do. So I'm going to like kind of parallel some of the things that um, he said in the book and kind of show you how they work in the birding world. So first of all, I'm going to um, give you a test and I don't want you to kind of freak out over this test. It's a bird identification quiz. And I want you to identify the bird and let's see, I think I can pull up the chat here. Um, and just in the chat, Tell me what you think it is, okay? And I'm gonna give you that time to identify that bird. <laughs> Not very much time. Hopefully somebody got it. Oh, somebody already got it. Other people are getting it. Other people are getting it. Pigeon, pigeon, rock pigeon, rock dove. It could be pigeon, city pigeon. It was a pigeon. So um, maybe some of you didn't get it in time, you know, in time, and that's fine. Don't feel bad about it. It's just a, what the point of that was, is to make you realize that you've been taught that, you know, birding and identification is about field marks. But if I show you something that went by that quickly, how can you see any field mark? How can you really, really process what that bird looked like? You just sort of quickly evaluated the whole thing and identified it. And this is sort of, I kind of call this the big lion birding because anytime you're out there on, on a walk and you have sort of an expert in front of you and let's say this black throated gray warbler flies through, stops in a bush and keeps on going. And they say, there's a black throated gray warbler. And you're, you lift, you know, you didn't even have time to lift your binoculars to see that. And you said, well, hold on, how, how, how do you know that was a black throat gray warbler? And what they will do every time is 
point out all the field marks that they've already memorized and tell you that that's how they identified it. But in fact, they didn't use all those field marks. The expert birder just knew what it was. It was, it was an automatic response that had nothing to do with the field marks. It's just what it looked like. And they knew it was a black third gray warbler, just like some people knew that was a pigeon without really knowing the field marks of a pigeon. In fact, most people don't even know what the field marks of a pigeon are. They just know what a pigeon looks like. And this is all through experience. So if you think about it that way, you, you realize that we're kind of thinking that we identify birds a certain way, but in fact, expert birders identify birds in a completely different way. And this is where the book comes in. Um, Kahneman says, you know, and a lot of researchers say that there's sort of two systems by which your brain thinks about things. There's system one, which is the fast system, and it's unconscious, it's automatic, everyday decisions, things you don't sort of really want to think about, but it that does have some error prone nature to it. System two is slow, conscious, effortful for complex decisions and really reliable. So when you're learning how to identify a bird, you know, like this Cooper's hawk and you're sort of going through all of the features and you're looking at the long tail and the, the round, you know, pattern, well, shape of the tail, I should say, and the white at here and the big head and the straight wings in the front. And, you know, you're looking at rusty coloration in there and so forth. You're going through all of this as system two. It's an effortful, conscious way to identify a Cooper's hawk. But the expert birder, maybe those at Hawk Hill, Hawk Mountain, whatever Hawk place they're watching them at, are actually using system one and automatically are identifying that as the Cooper sock without actually knowing how they're doing it. And this is the recognition versus identification situation. So you see something and you quickly know what it is, like this Anna's hummingbird, yet there are other things like this Thayer's gull, Iceland gull, that take more effort and here is one thing that you can sort of um, understand, especially if you're a beginner birder or you're sort of getting into this first few years and you, you start, you might have asked yourself, why is it that the expert birders are always interested in the ugliest birds? They want to look at brown gulls, flycatchers, um, winter sparrows, while well, there's tanagers, warblers, hummingbirds, and all these other things, ducks out there that are super beautiful and obvious. And that's the key, is that once you get into recognition and you automatically know what these things are, there's, it's not as much fun as going through system two and doing the puzzle. And for the expert birder, sometimes that's more fun just in the way a crossword puzzle is for a lot of people. And they are getting also to feel a little bit more like when they were beginning and everything is brand new when you're doing something difficult. While for the newer birder, the average bird, sometimes even colorful birds are difficult because there's so many and so much stuff's going on and you have to learn how to, you know, the movement, the shape, the, all these things that are actually effortful. So that is actually still a lot of effort for you so this is what happens, why um, the recognition versus the identification, why some birders who have been at this a long time like difficult uh, identifications, you know? So system two, it's effort, you know, like these hawks, ferruginous hawk, red-tailed hawk. For some people, this is easy. Other people, you have to really go through all the features, the shape of the wings, uh, you know, whether it has the dark patagial mark here that red-tails have or not and uh, to identify these things. Um, once you've seen something a bunch of times, let's say you really know the American kestrel and uh, you've gotten to know it over time and you sort of, you know, kind of just recognize it, you have really moved from knowing that bird through that system two, the slow way of thinking to the system one, the fast way of thinking without knowing it. And it's just through repetition. Um, the intuitive versus analytical thing, and this is where, you know, sort of the error prone aspect is. Here's a question that Kahneman poses. It's a sort of, it's a classic question. Baseball bat and a ball cost a dollar ten together. The bat cost a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Most people, 
most average people will say, well, the ball costs 10 cents because dollar and 10, but it's the ball, and, the bat and ball cost one tenth together and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So it's actually five cents, right? See, I, I, I have to think about this because I can't do this. I always get this wrong. <laughs> And it's because you go with your intuition, what sort of seems to make sense versus the analytical. Sometimes it's hard to not just be intuitive about something and go to the real thought process of it. Some people are really good at this, other people are not. And um, believe it or not, much of what we do is intuitive rather than analytical. We think we're being analytical, but our system too, is lazy and it wants to shove things over for the fast system, system one to take it over. So remember when you're trying to learn how to drive and it was a nightmare and somebody was there, you know, beside you telling you how it works and then you gotta press this, you gotta do this and don't go too fast and turn here and you gotta, all of these things that are going on in your brain, you're thinking, how am I ever gonna learn to drive? And now, if you've been driving for a while, you probably drive almost like you were sleeping um, because it's automatic. You've shifted all of that to your fast way of, of doing things rather than the analytical way. There's really almost no analysis that goes on in, in driving. So system one, intuition is actually the powerful one. It's the one that does a lot of things and makes us function. Uh, we're, we think of ourselves as real analytical creatures, but really we are intuitive creatures. Um, and it makes errors sometimes. So here's this white-tailed kite, really bad photograph of a white-tailed kite. And um, I thought it was a white-tailed kite when I first looked at that thing, but it actually is a plastic bag in a tree. And somehow that my intuitive ID, you know, quick system made that into a kite, even though it was a plastic bag. And I can actually see why. There's the patterns and the general size and so forth. It actually kind of looks like a kite, but it isn't. And this is where I was tricked. So I automatically identified this thing and it was completely off. Um, remember in the, um, we just, you know, went through this kind of in, a, in an international scenario, the twisties, when gymnasts are doing these really complicated things and they, you know, it was this, this whole, um, communication that sometimes you, you just sort of lose it for a while. And it's not that you can't do it. What's happening is that something you've made unconscious and automatic, you are shifting the system to again, you're actually being conscious about it. And you, you don't actually wanna be doing this consciously. You wanna do it automatically to do it safely and do it right. So this is kind of how powerful system one is. And when you, you know, when you're a birder and you just get something misidentified, it's no big deal. When you're you know, a gymnast and you're doing these really dangerous things, this is the big deal. You don't want to be putting yourself in danger when you realize your brain for whatever reason is, is not doing things the way it should be. Um, as birders also, we, we love to gather information and we love to um, <clears throat> sometimes feel like we have an answer to something. And then everything we see just confirms that answer we've already decided we know. <laughs> and that's confirmation bias. You know, where you have objectivity here and then what confirms your beliefs and you sort of try to make those things um, fit. So what you see really isn't fully objective. It never is. There's always some aspect of your brain too that's, uh, um, that is fitting what you believe should be happening, should be there and what have you. Uh, and reason I have this fairy thrush here is that when I lived in the East, I remember going to a, a, you know, a stakeout, there was a very thrush somebody had seen at a feeder, it's super rare in the East. And I remember a whole bunch of birders there, we're all sitting there looking for this rare bird and a bird came up in the back really hidden away and, um, it, it was reddish breasted with this dark band on the breast. And, you know, a couple of them said, there it is, very thrush, you know, they're super happy. The bird took off and they went off. And I thought, gosh, that didn't look quite right. I don't know, it, that bird came back and it was a robin, American robin, but it was deep 
in 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 the foliage and there was sort of a little shadow or branch or something that was making that bar on the breast and to them they had the bar on the breast a very thrush had been seen there very thrushes are sneaky they're in the dark and then the undergrowth and so was this bird everything fit except it wasn't a very thrush it was a robin um fortunately the real very thrush popped out later on and now uh, I got to see it. But these kinds of things happen and our system one gets uh, tricked all the time. These are three different fake birds <laughs> that I, I saw last year that, and believe it or not, like I still have a hard time with some of these. Like this one I see as a sleeping oyster catcher, but it's just a rock. It's just a shadow of the rock. It's not a sleeping oyster catcher, but it fits the habitat, everything, the ocean, except it's just the rock. I, I thought this was an owl, like a little screech owl sitting there. It's a dead leaf. And then my, I mean, I identified this even as species. This was a cinnamon teal, but it's a, it's a bottle floating around here locally at Pillar Cedar's uh, Creek mouth. Um, and I've started taking these pictures because I, I've, I've started listening to these, you know, leaf birds and um, rock birds, because they actually teach you something about how your brain is seeing the world and you actually are seeing birds. And when you actually see these non-bird -bird birds, you kind of understand why. And this is your automatic system being tripped uh, and, and it's incorrect, right? So, you know, field guides teach us to identify um, and we go through the field marks at first. These are geese from Chile. And you know, diff you can look at some are white, some have gray head, some have rusty breasts and so forth. And you go through and learn first the name of the bird and then what the field marks are, are of the bird. You see a bird like a, a coot, then what actually happens? You know, you, you take in all that information. You also take in the information of how far it is, where it is, if it's swimming, you're taking in all this, this data. And, it turns out that your brain has a way to use the very same part of your brain that identifies faces and recognizes people. Birders have co-opted this part of the brain to identify birds and recognize birds, just in the same way we're recognizing people. And there's an another talk and I can give you about some, how some of that happens. But there's also a thought that there are these cells neurons in your brain called grandmother cells that automatically kind of keep information of places and people and so forth that you can automatically sort of you see a person you know and you go ha ah, that's my grandma and the question is do we as birders also pack our brain with specific neurons that identify harlequin duck you know is there a Canada warbler neuron? Is there, you know, a Cape May warbler neuron that we eventually learn through repetition and we, as we load our brains up with this information? And I think there is. And also, I got to tell you this story about Canada warbler. I actually grew up in Canada. That's where I started birding. I used to see Canada warblers all the time, you know, in migration, you, just to see them. And they're great spring and fall. I would see them all the time. And then when I came out west, I actually did not see a Canada warbler for many years. And I remember going down to Columbia where they winter and having a Canada warbler pop up in front of me. And I tell you the feeling I had wasn't of, okay, this is new for the Columbia list or this is something I'd seen in a few years. The feeling was the very same feeling as if I'd seen somebody that I had not seen for years like a college buddy that I hadn't seen for years. And I saw this Canada warbler, I had that same feeling. And it's, it's not, you know, when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. We're using face recognition systems to actually recognize these birds. We're storing all this information in parts of our brain that have actually emotional content to them as well. These are not just names. These become kind of like friends. These are become birds that we know we, we actually had interactions with. And when you start thinking of birds in that way, there's another completely deep level of what birding is all about. And um, shifting gears to you know, identification and learning and all this, it, this can be really tiring for a brain to become 
a new birder and sort of understand how to do this, there's a lot of cognitive effort and you can get tired out. And sometimes it's best to just really start and deal with the things that you just find enjoyable and fun and pretty because you know you can get into this mess of different fly catchers and things and craziness that's just sort of overwhelming. Anytime you get overwhelmed as a birder, you've got to like dial it down because you cannot learn when you're overwhelmed. A little, little, little overwhelming, little, you know, mental strain is actually very good. But the moment it becomes too much and it's, it's not going to happen. You're not going to kind of learn a little bit more or enjoy a little bit more or see a little bit more. It's going to be just too much. We, we have selective attention and you have to concentrate when you're doing difficult things. Like, you know, if you really want to tackle the flycatchers, you really want to tackle all these shorebirds. And uh, it's, if you, you know, Google basketball and the gorilla, uh, maybe I won't tell you anything about that, but when you're concentrating on difficult tasks, sometimes you cannot see other things that are going on around you. Maybe that's the story to say here. But as you become more proficient at seeing the natural world and identifying and putting order to it, and it becomes more the, the system two hard stuff goes into the fast system one recognition stuff. What's really amazing is that you actually enjoy more of what you're seeing because you're not actually actively um, working through it all. You're just seeing it, knowing, understanding, and then other aspects of the natural world become what's important or what's sort of you know stimulating you when you're out there. But it never ends. There's always stimulation. There's always fun. Um, there's always more to see. But um, it's uh, it's interesting. You. You can chew and walk at the same time, maybe, uh, but when you're doing really con you know, difficult tasks, you cannot do two difficult tasks at once. So keep that in mind if you're really trying to tackle um, some of these more difficult uh, aspects of, of birding, like identifying goals. And uh, you know, you're not gonna be able to do math while you're doing Thayer's goals. But on the other hand, as you get more proficient at it, it uh, becomes easier because you're not actually thinking anymore. It's just automatic. And um, our memory to associate things in really interesting ways. I got to say that this is a European woodcock because I have a photograph of one, but the American woodcock that I grew up with in the East, they would arrive right after the snow had melted and the leaves were sort of, you know, still kind of um, wet on the ground. And um, there's a very specific fungus or smell that you know, after snow has melted and you just have that first mud and those first leaves and the heat is built up enough that there's sort of a chemical process going on there. There's a smell, there's something that if I smell that smell in March in a certain place, I know that woodcocks are there because I've associated this smell memory to woodcocks. Similarly, anytime I see puffy clouds like these on the right, I associate it with hawk migration because when after the cold front goes by, the wind shifts in the fall and you get these sort of puffy clouds that are the post frontal cloud systems, that's when the hawks would always go through. And um, you, you know, it seems sort of magical, but if you're kind of paying attention to nature, there are all these signs and things that you, once you sort of allow yourself to take them in, they're, they're really wonderful, like little things that, you know, are also extra benefits of paying attention. So, you know, predictability, repetition is how we do all of this as birders. We kind of, you know, the intuitive system, we maintain kind of a, a model of the world that represents what things should be, what the, what's normal, what a ring neck duck should look like, the head shape, the bill colorations. And then you repeat that, you see more ring neck ducks, you see more and they sort of keep um, adding up to your predictable system and understanding what these things look like. So that eventually it just gets to become part of what you know you understand and don't even think about, right? Just in the same way that you don't have to think about uh, a picture of your best friend and, and try to think about what their, what their name is, you just know 
because you you've incorporated all that in your in your being. This is a concept that he goes through is that it's basically reads what you see is all there is. <laughs> and the, the idea is that we are not rational thinkers as humans, we're intuitive, we shortcut and we have preconceptions and what we see, what we take in is all that we understand there to be. We're not usually kind of going beyond that. We see something, we take it in, we, uh, we do our shortcuts, our quickie analysis of things and then uh, that's how we interact with the world as humans. So I always think, if you think about all the birding literature that we have, the field guides, the apps and so forth, they're almost, all of them are doing this as if we were intuitive, rational thinking, you know, analytical people when we go birding. But in fact, we're not, we're knee jerk birders. That's, that's what we do. We kind of automatically understand or know something or, think about the habitat just automatically without thinking about it all. And we should sort of almost embrace that knee-jerk type birding so that, you know, you, you actually accumulate more information uh, easily as, you, as you're learning. Um, we are also sometimes close to not seeing the abnormal, the unexpected, because we, we live in a world where we expect the expected and that's one of the wonderful things about rare birds. It's the unexpected happens. And you, you think, why is it that some people are always the ones that find the rare bird? It's because actually they're good at seeing the unexpected. They're actually thinking about what could be here that shouldn't be here, or their brain is open to it in a way that they actually see these things when they fly in front of them. Well, most people just sort of say, oh, that must be a robin, not a very thrush if you're in you know, in Ontario in the East, rather than saying, hmm, that actually, maybe it's a very thrush rather than a common robin. Um, you know, if you think about it, when rare shorebirds show up, they're always in a little pond or close to the place where people see them because those are the ones that actually get more scrutiny than all of the thousands that are out there further on. So you realize that there's actually probably more unusual things out there that we're not seeing. We're just seeing the things that become so obvious because they're close or some aspect of it allows us to be open to seeing the abnormal. Um, so this eagle flies by and you might say, oh, there's a young bald eagle, except it isn't. I took the picture in Japan. This is a young white-tailed sea eagle, white-tailed eagle. And um, it would probably fly by most places in North America and we wouldn't see it as abnormal. We would see it as, as a bald eagle because that's what we expect. And that, that's what looks like this. But, um, you know, some people might actually see the differences. Most of it is actually in the tail shape, short and a little spiky kind of pointed tail. Um, so birding fast and slow. Um, this system one is the origin of what we sometimes do wrong, you know, jump to conclusions, but it's actually a, most of the time what we do right. <laughs> this is how we recognize birds. Um, and when, you know, things become unreliable, you have to be sensitive to this too. Like when you're looking at all these different goldfinches and trying to sort them out, and that's when you sort of actively go, okay, let's slow down here. Let's pay attention. Let's go to system two and sort all this out. Feather, you know, look at the undertail coverts, shapes, size of the bills, and then, aha, uh -huh, you know, we realize that, you know, certain one of these is lesser goldfinches, others are American goldfinches and so forth. Um, our brain does some amazing filling in of information too, that's, that's crazy. And um, I've told this story many times and um, I, you know, the person who was there with me, we were so embarrassed when this happened between both of us that we sort of said, we should never tell this to anybody. But now I think it's one of the greatest things that allowed me to see something completely differently in my birding. I was on my first trip to Alaska ever. I was going to a scientific conference as a grad student. I was with my supervisor, Jim Rising. And uh, Jim Rising is an expert on sparrows and taxonomy and orioles and so forth. He was a really renowned scientist. Um, 
And we were in the Denali Highway and I said, Jim, you know what? I think I see a gray crown rosy finch because, and this is a bird I really wanted to see. When you really want to see something, you see it. When you really want to see something, your brain makes it easier for you to sort of confirm that decision that you've already made that you, you're seeing this thing. And uh, gray crown rosy finch is a little sparrowy thing with gray on the crown. And I could see this thing brown with pale crown. We got it in the scope where we're actually, th these aren't the pictures of the real situation because we didn't have cameras to take the real photos. So I'm just showing you examples of what these birds look like. Jim goes and looks and goes, yeah, that's right. Great crown rosy finch. Now today I know that there are no great crown rosy finches in that part of Alaska. They don't actually exist there. I shouldn't have even had that as my expectation, but I'm seeing it. I've convinced this high level scientist that I'm seeing it and then it flew away and it was a golden eagle. And somehow this huge bird was way farther than we thought in this flat landscape and it was on the ground, it was in a different, and we were seeing the pale nape, the brown, and in my head, I made that into a great crime rosy finch, even though it com was the, completely the wrong thing. My brain filled in all the information that wasn't there. And only when the thing flew and it was impossible to actually maintain my original identification, did my brain snap out of it. And I went, oh, I really was not seeing what I thought I was seeing. I was, you're not an objective observer when you're out there uh, birding. So how do you get better at birding? How do you, how do you, do you want to get better? Do you, do you need to get better? The reality is you don't, but you know, you just enjoy it. But if you're really interested in, in sort of getting further along, having an easier time recognizing birds, being able to see more of the natural world by actually just recognizing all of these species like this Dunlin, you do it by repetition. You repeat, repeat, repeat imagery or the real live birds go and see a peregrine falcon, different views flying through, young ones, adults, nesting, not nesting, migrating, quick flybys. You, you see all of these different images of in life of a peregrine and it becomes automatically entrenched in what you know. But what's funny is that you actually can use imagery, actual photos online to, to also learn these birds. It's, it's, a, it's a, one of these things that is a, kind of fantastic, but you can actually look through images online, peregrines, and when you see the real thing, you will recognize it more easily or maybe automatically just from images. But it's always better to be out in the field watching the birds moving in 3D. That's definitely the best way to do it. You have to put in your time, you know, to if you really want to be an expert, expert, expert in people who've studied expert uh, of experts of all types. It's 10,000 hours of time in the activity. That's many years of looking at birds. Now, the cool thing is it's fun to look at birds. So, gosh, you know, several years of birding will go by in no time. Um, but also think about how you can incorporate more um, nature or watching in your daily life. Have, you know, half an hour, 15 minutes, just looking out in your backyard. That is something, that's time that you're paying attention. Um, walk to the grocery store instead of drive and pay attention to what you see. Do an eBird list each time you walk the dog and um, have binoculars around all the time. Um, now, you know, I'm not telling you to become obsessive, but if you're interested in getting more proficient, those little 15 minute increments of watching house finches in your backyard actually make you a better birder. Um, the, um, actually, I'll skip this bit, but um, expertise, you know, um, what you need to become expert to is, or better at this, is to have an environment that's regular, predictable, and then you learn from that regularity. Um, <clears throat> later, I'll tell you about stock trading and uh, other, other things. And this is a key. You don't ignore the common birds. In fact, the common birds are your teachers. They're the ones that will allow you to understand how to recognize birds. They're the ones that are going to be 
the many hours of watching birds when you're learning, it's gonna be house finches, house sparrows, scrub jays. Those are the birds that you build upon and then other birds start coming into the mix as you, as you move further and further out. It's a really um, distinct way of birding that some, some people do, especially in Europe called patch birding. And it's that they pick an area that they wanna to stick to near their house or a park or something, or even if you have a really great backyard, it could be that, where you learn and you watch birds throughout the year. You watch migration happen within your patch. You watch how the birds change so that the juvenile song sparrow is different than the adult, and then they molt and they do all these things. And many years of just watching your patch, you're gonna learn all these things that you cannot learn if you're going all over the place and not paying attention to one place. So it could be you know, a lot of people now are doing a five mile radius around their house, bird around there, and you consistently look around there close to where you live and you learn a ton by actually restricting the number of variables that are out there. So when you do this patch birding, something that is less common, like a Lincoln Sparrow versus a Song Sparrow, when it comes around, you can know what it is because you paid so much attention to Song Sparrows over the years. Um, Claudia Wilds was an amazing, amazing birder. Uh, she passed away some years ago, an expert, you know, and if, you know, I used to, when I was a teenager, I would, I, I got into, uh, you know, I would send her letters with some info and things, stuff that I was interested in, and she always replied. And to me, it, what Claudia Wilds was, um, you know, she had a certain opinion on something. She was almost always right, because this was a person who paid so much attention to so many things over the years that she had truly become an amazing, amazing expert. Um, but confidence in, in, in what we have in terms of how people view our expertise uh, expertise and confidence levels in birding or in anything are completely subjective. So I can tell you that I knew that Claudia Wiles was a true, true, um, you know, expert. But we have, um, if you look at CEOs of major companies and you ask them questions about the returns of the S&P 500 of their company, what stock levels they should be at that they consider high or they consider too low within an 80% confidence interval. So these are numbers that are so basic to the way that you run a company that they should be pretty much dead on within that 80% confidence interval. The CEOs of major companies are wrong 67% of the time when being asked, asked about these kinds of questions. So we have high confidence in these people and it, stock traders and so forth give you all these, uh, you know, uh, people who are, you know, analysts of, of uh, um, or politicians, what have you. We, we can get all these high confidence type people telling us what they believe and we trust them. But um, it's interesting that it's actually easier to trust a birder <laughs> than it is to trust these other people. And uh, I think it's an interesting kind of thought process to, see that we sometimes uh, um, we give um, authority to people who have confidence without necessarily knowing if they really truly know what they're saying or not. But in birding, it becomes so much about, uh, especially eBird and this and that, about what you know and what your experience level is. And sometimes it's all about just being open to being wrong and also open to learning. And um, you know we gotta be a little bit more um, uh, in, that, in that sort of landscape of thought. But if you do become an expert, you know, you put in all your time and all this, the most amazing thing to do is to teach others and to bring more people into the fold of birding and nature study because it's really necessary. We cannot actually keep on um, doing this and enjoying these birds if we don't have masses of people who are interested in birds so that they take care of them. Getting things wrong in public as a birder is almost like the worst thing that can happen to you. But I, I, I kind of submit this to you. When you commit to an identification and you do it in public, if you get it wrong, you learn. And you learn partially because of that trauma of like, oh my God, you know, like I shouldn't have said that, whatever. But you will actually learn better than if you don't say a thing. And if you don't do it 
and commit to an identification. And think about that as if you really want to learn, and if, you, if we're really interested in people learning about birds, getting things wrong is actually what we would, should be uh, encouraging, right? We should encourage incorrect identifications because that leads to a correct identification in the end. So, um, and, and we want people to learn. So I always think it's really funny that we have this thing about getting something wrong in public. Um, I'll end with a kind of a, a, a weird little sort of um, aspect, a couple of things. So big corporations try to emotionally get you thinking about their product in, and through logos, through colors, through all of these things to get you to want to feel something about their coffee or their, I don't know, vacuum cleaner, whatever. Emotional content is really important. So why is it that in birds, the things that really actually we love and people who write about them, we never talk about the emotional content that a bird gives you. So look at this, Wilson's warbler. He, to me, he, Wilson's warblers always look happy, friendly, and they, there's something jovial about a Wilson's warbler that you know, I don't see in a yellow warbler. Uh, yellow warbler looks kind of empty-faced. Actually, they, they kind of look dumb to me. Wilson's warbler looks kind of ready to help friendly person in the in the neighborhood. So if we described all those things to this bird, it's very unscientific, but if we actually describe the bird this way, people actually would have a easier time learning how to identify Wilson's warbler versus another warbler because they're actually seeing that emotional content of that bird's expression. Um, here's a chickadee, just my cap chickadee. I would say this is cute little chickadee. This is mean chickadee, mountain chickadee. All that happens is there's a little stripe above the eye and it changes the entire emotional content of what you see with that bird. It's still a cute chickadee, but it looks a little bit more aggressive than chestnut back, right? And you won't see that in any field guide, yet that's how I incorporate, that's how I actually see these birds. And it's way easier to identify them once you start seeing their faces. Um, we can go through all of this really you know, complicated ways to separate these shorebirds. And, you know, if you're looking for a ruff, for example, versus, you know, buff breasted or lesser yellow legs, this ruff, if you look at the face and if you look at the eye, look at the eye, there's not much going on in the face, but right behind the eye, just a little stripe. And the moment you realize that ruff is Cleopatra, you know how to identify a ruff. You don't have to see any other aspect of that bird, just that face with a little stripe behind it, and that facial expression identifies a rough. You don't have to count primaries or any of that other stuff. It just automatically is there. And I tell people, if you really want to learn to do sketches, notes on paper, actually, it works best on paper. Do your notes, little sketch, and you can recycle this, never see it again, and the work has been done to incorporate that information into your brain once you've done the hand-eye coordination of putting all that together. And um, it's, it's, it's a, amazing, you know, how quickly you can start, you know, learning. And there is a little bit of, you know, the moment you kind of get into the cognitive strain, um, like if you, if you write a complicated um, story in a difficult font, people actually pay more attention to the words. There is an element of that when you're, there's a bit of strain in your birding, you do learn a little bit more because you're paying more attention. But the moment it becomes too much, like I said before, it, it doesn't work anymore. You got to have a good time. Those 10,000 hours will go, you know, in no time if you've got your endorphins going, looking at these warblers, finches, just having a good time is the way you learn the best and how you spend most more time in, in the environment. It's just because you're enjoying it. And a big list actually does not make you happy. And we might be always chasing the bigger list, seeing a county bird and so forth. And it can be tons of fun. Don't get me wrong. I think the real thing though, is that we we're interested in novelty. We want, we want new things. We want to see new things. But the actual list, the number, it 
it doesn't actually make you happy. And sometimes when you go look for a bird, specific bird, and you don't see it, that hurts way more than the gain if you had seen it. And keep that in mind. So the moment that birding becomes kind of like, oh, that was a bummer, uh, dial that back down too, because you're going to be having a good time. This is one of the best things. Birding is one of the most awesome things in the world. You should not be having a bad time doing it or feeling crappy when you're out there in the field. And thinking of lists, birds are not a commodity. Every single checklist, checklist um, X, you know, is not the same. A stellar sea eagle counts for 101 tyrannulates in South America because all the tyrannulates look the same and you're gonna forget them, but you will never forget a stellar sea eagle when you see one. There are some birds that actually are amazing in ways that, you know, other birds are less so. They're all cool, but you got to accept that birds are not a commodity. And, you know, calmness, Zen, birding as meditation, I go back to the goals. I enjoy them because they make me feel calm because I can go through this puzzle and so forth. And I don't actually care if I figure out what they are, what they're not, but just the process of looking at them here at my local beach just calms me down. And I get to think about something that is completely not anything else that is one of my worries in life. I just get to look at tertials, patterns, streaking. And while that may seem silly for me, there's a level of meditation that happens in this that I know is a nightmare for other people. So just find where, where you are in birding. You know, we focus on what makes you happy and figure out what your birding personality is, what you want, you know, type A, just look at backyard birds, just pretty birds. You want excitement, list chasing, um, the adrenaline. It's all great. Everything works. You just have to find what works for you. Um, also, life is too short to bird with unpleasant people. If there's people who you don't gravitate to in the birding world, find your niche of people who are supportive of how you want to bird and help you out as you're birding and make you feel like you know, you're all colleagues in this amazing world that is birds, nature, nature study. And you'll learn more quickly, you'll have more fun. Just find the right people. Just because somebody is you know, a renowned expert doesn't necessarily mean you have to hang out with them. And um, finally, you know, I live in Half Moon Bay. It's known for big wave surfing, mavericks in the winter, this crazy huge 40 foot killer wave that happens every so often. And I went, I've been there to watch Mavericks and it's interesting to see all of these surfers watching Mavericks and they're all amazingly excited. They're watching through binoculars at these people doing extraordinary things out on the waves. And all of them are surfers, yet most of those people will never actually go on Mavericks, yet they're a community together watching something amazing that they're part of. And I think that in birders, we should think about that more, that we are a broad range of different people that do different things. And a backyard birder is as much a birder as a year lister or somebody who's, you know, describing new species or wandering around the world, you know, um, in Brazil, looking at you know, birds, they're all birders and we all have a place and we all have to support each other and make this a bigger tent of birders um, rather than trying to sort of, you know, categorize some people as, oh, they're just the backyard birder. They're not a real serious birder. They're not on eBird. It doesn't matter. We're all birders. And I think we got to start thinking that way. And, you know, when, when I was growing up, you know, I'd be out there with my birds and people I knew would say, you know, this is wonderful, this uh, bird thing you have. And I started when I was 11 years old. And they said, but, uh, you know, you want to be a biologist and all this. And that's great. But, you know, you really should think about this. You should think clearly about this because you're a smart kid, Alvaro. And um, there's a lot of things you could be doing. And uh, as you get older, you'll find that the real world, you know, it's, it's difficult and there's, uh, there's a lot going on out there and maybe birds could be a hobby. Um, you know, I had this thing happen many times and they, they were all well-meaning people, but 
you know what, I think, you know, I'm seeing all those hawks here over the city and thinking, is this the real world or is this the real world? This natural world is the real world. And I feel like without knowing it, you know, I've come to this um, realization that although it's been tough to be a nature oriented person trying to make a living, it's really vital that we pay attention to the real world, our natural world, and we take care of our natural world because it's, it really is the part that's gonna keep us alive. And as a birder, it's so amazing that you get to go out to places that are beautiful and uh, just lively with birds. And that gives you some health benefits and it's just fun. And uh, so, you know, thank you. And I think one day, when you're feeling a little down or something and you go to the doctor, they might actually say, you know what, I've got a, I've got something for you and it's called nature. And their doctors are going to start prescribing nature to people because it's what is going to keep us healthy and alive. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this kind of little weird talk about um, maybe not the way we tend to see birding. I do birding tours. So if you ever are interested, eventually we'll be traveling around the world again, seeing birds and enjoying ourselves. So uh, look me up at alvarosadventures.com. But uh, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing here and I hopefully there'll be some questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Alvaro. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat. I'm going to try and see the chat here. Uh, could you put your website up again, Alvaro? Oh, um, yeah. Like share the, let's see, share the screen here. All right, there we go. You see that? Alvaro'sAdventures.com. <laughs> Well, what we're getting is we, we haven't gotten any specific questions, but everybody is just saying this was an awesome presentation. You, you know, I, I can understand that because it's sort of like, I think I think a lot of people probably their brain spinning a little bit and they're like, gosh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to ask. There. We have one question is that what are some shorebirds we could see from Morro Rock? We will be visiting oh. from Arizona. Oh, um, well, there should be willets and, you know, um, marble godwits out there in the, in the mud flats. They're two big ones along with black belly plovers. So they're the big guys. Some peeps like Western sandpipers and least um, small guys. And um, those are those more beach mud flat oriented birds, but there are, you know, Morro Bay's had an amazing list of shorebirds altogether. You know, almost every, every shorebird out there has been seen in Morro, Morro Bay. Wimbrels, um, et cetera. So I probably, there's a lot I'm not mentioning, but if you just sort of are visiting, maybe some of those things will be of interest. Um, and do you think we are, as birders, are drawn to birding because we are more observant of people and life and emotions in general? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, some, some birders, we have such a, such a gamut, you know, some, I know some birders that are actually very, uh, they, they're not real people, 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 and they like birding because of that. They can do it sort of solitarily. On the other hand, we have other people who are just, you know, social, jovial, more emotional people who like birding and birds in general, because they are it, they incorporate so much, you know, you can go out with friends and you can see these wonderful things almost anywhere. So I think, gosh, I, I don't know if, I don't know if we're special in any way. Um, Cause it, it can attract almost anybody. That's, that's what I think is special about birding. Once we, once you identify the fact that we don't ha all have to be birding in the same way, you realize that birding can almost be done by everybody on earth in their own way. And that there's nothing I can think of that's quite like that as far as sort of a pastime, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, have you come across an educational system that includes birding as part of the curriculum internationally or nationally? No, not, not really, but, but, you know, one could, I guess, um, create something like that. There's a, there's a lot to it. You know, it's not just observation, but there's, you know, um, you can go analytical or you can go completely the, the poetic side with, with birding, you know, it, it's, oh uh, yeah, that'd be interesting, but I haven't seen it. Um, somebody's looking for a good book to let them know about migration. Got any, I would say that uh, Ken Kaufman just wrote a book out, I believe it's called On the Wind, if I, something along those lines. Yeah, and I've heard about that book and I haven't read it. So I, but anything Ken Kaufman does tends to be great. <laughs> and Scott, uh, Scott Widensall, some years ago, wrote a book about migration that, what's it called? Living on the Wind? Could Maybe be? that's the book I was thinking of. No, I think there's, I think there are two. I think Ken okay. Kaufman did do one and yeah. Oh, but, but Scott Widensall did a, a book some years ago. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Let's see. Oh, uh, hold on a second. <laughs> Somebody is asking about a hummingbird ID. I'm not sure we can help with that this time. <laughs> so, well, um, right yeah, now it's probably an anise. <laughs> World on the Wing by Scott Wiedensall is the okay. name. Of okay. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Alvaro, and I'm going to turn it back over to Judy. Well, thank you so much, Alvaro. That was outstanding. Um, I'm going to echo somebody's uh, comment that it's really nice to have permission to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know we, we uh, do programs for kids in the schools around here. And one of the things Karen Perry really pushes is that eventually you will get to a point where just like you can look at your friend in school from a distance and know it's them without having to look at field marks, you know it's them. And that's exactly what you were saying tonight about yeah. that's, that system one of recognition of the birds. And so having that that uh, reinforced was really important for me tonight. So thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank well, you. thank you everybody for coming. We look forward to seeing you in a month on the 18th of October for California Osprey. So thanks a lot, Alvaro. and. Uh, we will hopefully see you down here. You come down to go birding. I would love to go birding with you sometime. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll see if we can do something one day. Um, that would be great. Like I said, I'll be coming around more because of my son being down there. Right. Cal Poly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Good enough. Bye -bye. Thank you all for coming. Good night. <laughs>